Are we expecting the universal um, basic income? That is part of the Star Trek future. In Star Trek, there is no money. Everything's free. And, and, and I think that's where we'll end up, where we will effectively tax the robots initially and generate cash to then give to people. This is Romania. You've got 60% uh, of your people are of working age today. By 2050, just over half your people will be of working age. All the other people will be old or too young to work. And over time, you can see down at the bottom, as we go through time from 1990 through to 2100, you can see that your pyramid rapidly changes. And that has real serious implications. Part of this is that your taxes will go up. Part of this is that you will work longer. So many of you in this room, your retirement age will be closer to 80 than it is what it is today. So I'm here to tell you lots of good news today. <laughs> Here's a tip. Just before Zoran dies, just take a little bit of him off. Uh, it doesn't have to be a paw or something, just a hair or two. Stick it in the fridge, and then you can send it to this company, Viacom, and they can make you Zoran 2.0. And Zoran 2.0 will look exactly like Zoran 1.0 when he grows up. Sounds like a good deal, huh? In 2023, we grew a whole model of an embryo without a sperm or an egg. So simply by taking your stem cell, we can create a new embryo, a new baby. Wonderful to be here in this incredible city of Aradia. What a beautiful theater you have here. What a beautiful city you have here. I feel really honored to be here with you. I'm gonna be talking to you about how the world is changing and it's changing with increasing uncertainty. You know, not only do we have to worry about our businesses every day, we have to worry about all of these things happening in the world and they're all happening with increasingly, you know, they're happening more, more often and they're all happening at the same time. This is a lot for business people to deal with, all of these changes together. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how the world is changing. We're gonna focus on three of these areas. We're gonna talk about uh, demographics, changing attitudes and tech disruption. And the point of talking about this is to say, actually we need different organization strategies to deal with this, and we also need to be different as leaders as well. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, as I say, I'm gonna focus on these three. Um, but first, I thought I'd give you a quiz. Um, if I gave you a quiz where there were 10 questions with three multiple choice answers, how, what do you think, and the quiz was about world statistics, how long people live, that kind of thing. Um, what do you think you would score out of 10 on that quiz? So just make a mental note. Would you score nine, eight, seven maybe? What would you score in a quiz out of 10 about world statistics? Okay, um, so I've done this quiz with 11,000 people now, and this is the average score. The average score is actually, um, the average score is two out of 10. And uh, you can see that 21% of people get zero. So half of people get either zero or one. So how many of you got three or less? Three or less? Okay, that's the vast majority of you. Here's the problem. If I'd given that quiz to a little two-year-old kid, the two-year-old kid would have got three out of 10 because it was a multiple choice quiz. I could have given it to a monkey. The monkey would have got three out of 10. So you guys deliberately scored less than a random monkey would have scored. What's going on? It's because, here's the thing, if you go back, and we'll get you a copy of these slides, if you go back and redo the quiz and select the most positive answer, then you will score 10 out of 10. So if you scored zero, that means you think the world is much worse than it really is. And if you scored three or fewer, then you do think the world is worse than it really is. And that's because the news is basically talking about bad stuff. And even if the news was talking about good stuff, we tend to pay more attention to bad stuff. So the world is much better than we think it really is. And I just wanted to start with, sometimes our view of the world is different than what, what's reality. The other thing that happens Oh, by the way, if you're interested in this, then the chap who got nine, have you read this book? Yes, okay, that's right. So in this book, you'll find a similar quiz. Factfulness is all about how the world is better than you really think. Um, 
there's this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is measuring how much you know against how confident you are. And you would think that as you know more, your confidence would grow up, go up like that, yes? Makes sense. Here's what actually happens, and these guys won a Nobel Prize for this. You know a little bit about something and you're super confident. And as you get to know more about a topic, you actually, your confidence level actually drops. And the reason is, is when you're here, you know more about what you don't know. So part of the job that we're going to be doing today and what I'm trying to do this morning is to take you down that curve, to give you more information that will make you less confident in talking about these subjects. Very often weird thing for a professor to say, but I'm going to make you less confident talking about these subjects. And that's a good thing. I'll explain why at the end. Okay, so let's start with demographics then. And, uh, you know, the replacement rate in a developed country is 2.1. Everybody needs to have 2.1 kids to keep the population about the same. You know, ignoring people living longer, ignoring immigration, everybody needs to have 2.1 kids. And what's been happening to the birth rate around the world is it's been declining by a lot. 50 years ago, women around the world were having almost five kids. Now it's less than half that, and it's predicted to go down further. So I'd love to know, how many of you think this is a good thing? Put up your hand if you think this is a good thing. Can, can I see the lights, please? That'd be great. Okay, how many of you think this is a bad thing? Okay, too many of you didn't vote. You, good thing, bad thing. Okay, who thinks it's a good thing? Half of you, <laughs> who thinks it's a bad thing? The other half, okay, <laughs> interesting. Um, I'm not an accountant for nothing. Um, so let's see, uh, have we got any Italians in the room? No, well, good, because I'm going to talk about Italy. Um, uh, <laughs> Italy had a birth rate last year of 1.24, uh, let's call it 1.2. They have a population of 60 million people. Let's assume half of them are men, half of them are women. How many kids will they have in the next generation? Well, you multiply it's only the women that can have kids, so you multiply 30 million by 1.2 and you get 36. Do it again, and what you've done is within two generations, half made the population of Italy go down to almost a third of what it is today. Is that a problem? Well, last year, in 2023, Italy had almost 300,000 more people dying than being born. And the only reason the overall population didn't go down is because they had that much immigration. And you probably know Giorgia Maloney, who's the PM of Italy, she really doesn't like immigrants, but basically immigrants saved her country last year, because if she didn't have this many people, in 18 years time there'll be 282,000 fewer adults coming into Italy. There'll be 282,000 fewer kids going to school. She says, a nation that doesn't invest in having children is destined to disappear. And she's telling all Italian women, you've got to have more children. She has one daughter, but anyway. <laughs> so um, you look around the world and you say, where is the birth rate above, I don't know, even two? And which countries do you think the birth rate's above two? Just shout out. India, China, China, okay, Africa. Not a country, but we'll take that, the whole of Africa. Anywhere else? France, France, yeah, they have loads of kids in France. Where else? Sweden, Sweden. Oh, no, that's totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's too cold. Um, <laughs> so these are the only countries in the world where it's above about two. That's it. There are no other large countries in the world where we're having more than two kids per couple. It's mostly Africa, Pakistan, Philippines, and then South Africa, and then India and Myanmar are kind of at replacement rate or below replacement rate. It's only those countries at the top. That's it. The middle countries are these. India. India is not above replacement rate. India is only at two. France is only 1.8. It's higher than most European countries, but it's only 1.8. Brazil, 1.6. A lot of the Catholic countries are really low down on here. Uh, Spain, Ireland, Portugal, etc. Romania is the same as the UK at 1.6. And when you look at the bottom, then you've got Germany, Russia, Italy, uh, Thailand, Japan, China, South Korea. 
China's 1.2. They had a one-child policy so that people couldn't have more than one kid. So then they instituted a two-child policy and the birth rate went down. So then they introduced a three-child policy and the birth rate went down. So often what governments are trying to do to reverse these things doesn't work. The neighbor here, Hungary, has been trying for many years to increase the birth rate by offering all sorts of things. No taxes, you don't pay taxes if you have more than four kids, for example. It's not really affected it. It's kind of stabilized it around 1.5, but it hasn't increased it tremendously. In South Korea, there's companies offering you $72,000 if you have a kid. $72,000 for a kid. Their birth rate dropped from 0.82 to 0.72. Japan's population has been dropping by half a million every year for about 12 years. Uh, there's a lot more migration, and the birth rate in Romania is now at the lowest level in 134 years. So, how many of you think this is a good thing? Okay, still a few of you. Okay, <laughs> let's carry on then. Uh, so, when you look at the map of the world, this map is more accurate in terms of how big countries are in relation to each other. Africa really is that big. Greenland really is that small. But anyway, you look at this map and you say, um, where did most of the work people live in the world? And it turns out more people live inside that circle than outside it. Now, I have a lot of clients in Germany and US and UK, and they think of themselves as global companies. And I ask them, how many people do they have on their, on their board who's from within that circle? And the answer is usually zero. This is where the growth is. The GDP purchasing power parity is growing much faster here than it is in Europe or the US. And this is where most of the people live in the world as well. And they're fast becoming richer. They're entering the middle class. That's why they're traveling more. That's why it's difficult for you and more expensive for you to travel because there's more Indians and more Chinese people traveling than ever before. And Africa, one in four people in the world by 2050 will be African. So there the growth areas is largely Asia, and Africa. If you're a global company, that's where you need to be. So um, here's something that as the birth rate begins to go down, the average age of a country goes up. And you can see here China used to have six kids per couple, and now they're having sort of two, less than two, and the average age is moving down to about 40 or 50. So actually, these are the real ages. The average ages in 2023 of different countries. So if you are 48 in Japan, you're young. And if you are 20 in Nigeria, you're old. And if you're 42 in Romania, you're young. If you're 44, you're old. So that's... Uh, <laughs> you're a pretty old country compared to the global average of 31. Um, what, what, so what? What do we care? Well, if you're a company based in, say, Japan, Italy, Germany, or even Romania, and you're trying to sell into Africa or Asia, not only, you know, you're a 47-year-old German trying to sell to 90-year-old Nigerian, not only are they different culture from you, they're a complete different generation than you. You could almost be their grandfather. So you really need to think differently about how we attack those markets from people from these older countries. By the way, going back to Italy, because I like to pick on Italy, Italy has more people over 80 than under 10. Right? And Romania is going that way too. This is Romania's population. It's declining and aging. And over the years, it went up. And around the 1980s, 1990s, just as you came out of communism, it started to go down as your people started to go to other places. And it's now, because of your low birth rate, forecast to go even lower down to about 16.4 million. Today, it's around 19 and a half million. Um, 2023, the population went up by 10,000 people, but that included 82,000 immigrants. So if you hadn't had the immigrants in Romania this year, you would have gone down by 70,000 people, which is a lot for a country the size of Romania. It's almost a problem the size of Italy's. You have 734, 5,000 older people more than people under 50. 735,000 more people over 65 than under 50. 
So you've got a rapidly aging society, which means that if you're selling products, you need to bear in mind that your consumers are going to be very different, are very different now than they were in the past, and they're going to be even more different in the future. Here's some population pyramid. The red lines show you people of working age, and you can see US kind of looks like a tall pyramid, still does by 2050. When you look at Germany, it's a bit of a mess, doesn't look like a pyramid. You look at China, a bigger mess, it looks like a diamond. And then finally, you look at Korea, it's an upside down pyramid today, and it becomes even worse in the future. Down here in 2050, there are so few people of working age here, they're supporting all of these old age people and a few children as well. So, what does this mean? Well, actually, let's take a look at Romania. This is Romania. You've got 60% uh, of your people are of working age today. By 2050, just over half your people will be of working age. All the other people will be old or too young to work. And over time, you can see down at the bottom, as we go through time from 1990 through to 2100, you can see that your pyramid rapidly changes. And that has real serious implications. Part of this is that your taxes will go up. Part of this is that you will work longer. So many of you in this room, your retirement age will be closer to 80 than it is what it is today. So I'm here to tell you lots of good news today. Okay. I'm here to tell you the truth. Anyway, um, so what's happening all the way around the world, what we're suffering from is not enough people to do work. This is the US. The latest stats from the US show that Back in 2009, there were six people for every job vacancy. Now, it's down to less than one person for every job vacancy. If you're looking for a McDonald's chef, you're going to find it difficult. If you're looking for a cybersecurity expert, you're going to find it near impossible. And this is happening across the rest of the world as well, whether it's the EU or Germany. Germany is targeting Indian students to do engineering. Meanwhile, the Indians are facing a shortage of 150 million skilled workers. And China, the world's factory, is short of 30 million manufacturing workers. They have 24 million unemployed young people. Why don't those 24 million people do some of the 30 million jobs that are available? They don't want to. They don't want to fix your iPhone when they've got a degree in economics. So we've got a big skills mismatch going on around the world. Uh, this is Romania. And, and basically, uh, EU labor supply of Romania. So you are a labor supplier to the rest of the EU. You're having to turn to Asia to cover your own skills gaps. And we're seeing this around the world in many countries as well. So that's the good news on demographics. Let's talk about the good news on changing attitudes. You know, one of the things uh, that we're finding that employees want more is they want more flexibility. And my former employer, EY, did a survey around the world in 22 countries. And they asked people, when you say you want more flexibility, what kind of flexibility do you want? And people say, you know, all I want is flexibility in where I work, what work I do, when I work, who I work with, why I work, and how I work. <laughs> Just give me all that and I'll stay. It's easy. And it, it, it isn't easy for an employer to offer these. But it is true that the more of these you offer to your people, the better, uh, the more engaged your people will be, the more they'll want to be with you. Um, you know, even Zoom is making its uh, people come back to the office. That's how serious things have become. Um, and, and, and social media is changing everything. What we're finding in social media is this is the hours that people are spending on social media across the world. Romania is kind of at the average of two hours a day. But in Nigeria, they're spending over four hours a day on social media on average, including the grandmas. On average, four and a half hours a day on social media. And when you compare this to the average age, you can see that there is a correlation. The older you are, the less likely you are to use this social media. How are consumers changing? This is a guy called Lipstick Brother in China. And, uh, you know, he was selling lipstick in a department store. A, a young kid, 21 years old, in, in China. And nobody was buying lipstick from him. Why would you buy lipstick from a young man? So he decided to wear the lipstick himself. And as women walked into the department store, they saw him wearing lipstick and they went up to him and 
he started becoming quite successful. So Alibaba on Singles Day asked him to sell cosmetics for a day. Um, on, you know, 11th of November, 11 11, Singles Day. What do you think was the value in dollars of the cosmetics he sold in one day? 100 million? Sorry, what was that? A billion. Okay, it's a lot. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, yes. Uh, well, actually, he sold $2 billion in that one day. $2 billion. L'Oreal is the biggest cosmetics company in the world, does $120 million a day. This guy did $2 billion in one day. So consumers and the way we consume and how we buy is revolutionary.